think of all the things in this kitchen that spring into action by the simple flick of a switch. I mean, when you look around, we'd be in real trouble if the switches stopped working, wouldn't we? It'd be cold food for a start. We're all so used to electricity, I bet you'd never think just how important it is. Go on, look around the room at all the things that need electricity to work. The lights, the toaster, we even use it to tell the time. It helps to keep our clothes clean. Wherever you look, you see gadgets and tools and appliances that need electricity to make them work. It's useful stuff, all right. But never forget, the electricity that comes out of the plugs to make all this possible is extremely dangerous stuff. Never play with it. Now, I'm going to show you how to do experiments with the kind of electricity that is safe to you. So, make some room and let's get going. Now, you know I'm electric, but did you know you've got electricity stored up inside you too? We'll use that electricity for our first experiment. Leo, hold the comb over those little bits of paper and see what it does. And that's happening because just by combing your hair, you've charged the comb with something called static electricity, and that's what's making the paper stick. You have a go, Tom. See what else you can pick up with static electricity. Breakfast cereal. Well, who'd have thought it? The static electricity is picking it up all right. <laughs> Breakfast will never be the same again. What else can we charge up? Try your balloon, Leah. Rub it on your sleeve and charge it up. That's even better than the comb. They're jumping up like magic. And it keeps on going because the balloon is holding the charge of static electricity. Charge up another balloon, Piers. Rub it hard on your sleeve and over to the sink. You need just a thin trickle from the tap. A final rub to get that static electricity going again. Now hold the balloon near the water. It's pulling it right over. Be careful not to get the balloon wet because it won't work. Well, there's no doubt about that experiment. The charged up balloon is attracting the stream of water. The static electricity is bending it and holding it there. Right, get it charged up, Tom. That's it, rub it hard. What else will it stick to? Any ideas, Leah? Sticks like glue. The next time we have a party, you can stick the balloons to the ceiling and decorate the place. And what else will it attract? Try that long piece of paper. It looks like a coiled up snake. See if you can charm it into the air. Oh, the whole lot's going up. Pull the plate away, Tom. That's right. You've done it. The balloon's holding it up there. And down it goes. Now, what exactly is happening when you do all these things with static electricity? Well, for the next experiment, you need a jar and a skewer and some more tissue paper, and we'll try to find out. Right, get it set up, Tom. Screw the lid on tight.
a little bit of tissue paper is just hooked over the bottom of the skewer. Charge up the balloon, and now what will happen? The tissue paper's on the move again. The charge from the balloon is travelling along the skewer and down into the jar. When the balloon is close to the skewer, the ends of the tissue move apart. Take it away and they close up again. Let's just do one more static electricity experiment. You'll need the balloon again. Now, I said before that we've all got electricity in our bodies. So, let's see how much Leah has in hers. Yes, this is hair-raising stuff. But you see what's happening? The charge in the balloon is attracting some part of the electricity in her hair. Of course, you could never do that to me, because my head is made of a special material that is perfect insulation, and it just won't conduct a charge of electricity at all. The balloon can't even stick to me, but with you, it's different. All the atoms in your bodies have got little particles called electrons whizzing about. And some of these electrons are being attracted from Tom's hair at this very moment because you've been rubbing loose electrons off the balloon. And the balloon is trying to find more electrons to balance things up. And it's going after the ones in Tom's hair. That's funny. Disc number 16, please. The particles and ice crystals rubbing together in storm clouds sometimes produce lots of static electricity. But did you know there are usually two flashes close together? A faint one comes down from the clouds like this, but the bright one you usually see is actually loose electrons jumping from the earth back into the clouds. It's as if the clouds have been charged up like our balloon and the earth's hair is standing on end. About 250 years ago, Benjamin Franklin was the first person to work out that lightning was electricity, and he invented the lightning conductor. But he took a terrible risk. He flew a kite in a thunderstorm just to see what would happen, and he was very nearly killed when it was struck by lightning. Before we do any more experiments, I must tell you something very, very important, and you must never forget it, so listen carefully. Nobody should ever do experiments with the electricity from the wall plugs or the light sockets. That is a different kind of electricity and it is extremely dangerous. So keep them switched off. That's right, dears, switch off because no matter what happens, you never touch that for an experiment. We use something much neater, a small battery which is very safe. Right, connect up for our next experiment. Piers, you're in charge of the red wire, and Celia, you're in charge of the black wire. The first thing to do is to make what's called an electrical circuit. Take the red wire and clip it onto one of the torch bulb terminals, and the black wire goes onto the other terminal. The light goes on, and you've made a circuit. And that means that electricity is flowing from one side of the battery to the other. A circuit. Disc number 10, please. But what exactly is electricity? Well, imagine the big red ball is an atom. The little white balls are electrons. All atoms have electrons, and it's the electrons that were flowing through the circuit to light the torch bulb. Nearly 200 years ago, this Italian physicist, he was called Alessandro Volta, invented a way to make electric current. This is what he made, and he called it a voltaic pile. 
It was a battery made from silver and zinc discs separated by wet fabric pads. And what happened was that the different substances in his battery produced a flow of electrons which gave him an electric current. Volta had discovered that when two substances were put together, the electrons round the atoms of one material wanted to join up with the atoms of the other. That's what electricity was, because electricity is made only when electrons move. If you look inside a torch battery, you find various substances, and they're doing exactly what Volta's pile did. The electrons from one of the substances are racing to join the atoms of another substance. There are different sorts of batteries these days made of a variety of things, but the combinations they put together are always carefully chosen because one of the substances wants to pass its electrons on to another. Then all you have to do is to get the electrons to flow along a piece of wire and lead it to where the electricity can be used. Let's see if we can make our own battery. Yes, lemons, useful. A strip of zinc which wants to give its electrons away. and a piece of copper which wants to take up electrons. The acid lemon juice is only too happy to help it all happen. Wooden clothes pegs to clip the copper to the zinc. It's just the same kind of thing that Volta did when he connected up his sandwich of silver and zinc and invented the battery all those years ago. And with only three lemons, there's already a flow of electrons that can be measured on the special meter we borrowed from the laboratory. Look at that. A dozen lemons all connected up. Now, how much electric current will we get out of that, do you think? The zinc and copper plates are clipped together, so the electrons must be flowing. It's not much electricity, but it's just enough to get this tiny little motor going. Let's see if you remember how to wire up an electric circuit. Now you've got all you need, the wire, a battery, Show me the battery terminal there. Yes, and how is it wired? The wire leads down to the light bulb. Yes. And the black wire should return to the other battery terminal. But I see it doesn't. There's a gap. And that's where we're going to put a light switch, so that when it's on, it completes the circuit back to the battery again. Can you complete the circuit, Leah? The light hasn't come on. Have you got a better idea, Tom? A paper clip, eh? That does it. The electrons wouldn't pass through the wooden matchstick, but they skate through the metal paper clip. Up and the bulb is off. Down and the light goes on. That's interesting. The plastic spoon handle won't let the electricity pass. But the metal part of the spoon does. That means it's a good conductor of electricity. But the plastic is a bad conductor because it won't let the electrons pass through it. You see, the light doesn't go on when the plastic handle is part of the circuit. That's why they cover electric wire with plastic, of course. It doesn't conduct electricity, so it keeps the current safely in the wire. Strip off the plastic covering.
The copper strands inside conduct electricity beautifully. There's the light back on again, because the circuit is completed. But the moment you move the wire away, out it goes. That's the principle of the electric switch. Electricians call it making and breaking the circuit, and you can see why. Let's experiment with a dimmer switch, the sort that fades the lights up and down. This is one with a difference, isn't it, Surya? Part of the circuit of the battery is a strip of pencil lead. The electrons don't like going through it much, so the less lead there is, the better, as far as they're concerned. Once you know that, you can make a dimmer switch. As the distance between the paper clip and the crocodile clip gets less, more electricity gets through, so the bulb gets brighter. Do it the other way, and it dims again, because the electricity is having to force its way through more and more pencil lead. Of course, the paper clip and the crocodile clip are both connected to the terminals of the battery with wire, or you wouldn't have a circuit at all. And if there wasn't a bulb, there'd be no point in having a dimmer switch. Switching to replay. This is Thomas Alva Edison, and we have him to thank for inventing the first practical electric light bulb. This is the kind of thing he made. The key to his success was the filament, that loop in the middle. Edison found that if it was made of a material that resisted the electric current, then it would glow when the electrons tried to get through. What happens is that the electrons collide with the atoms in the material the filament is made of, and it makes them jiggle about so much that they give off light. They also give off heat, because light and heat tend to go together when electrons start moving around fast. If you choose a substance with atoms that really don't like too many electrons passing by, and you make it thin enough, you can use it as an electric fuse. Too much current, and the fuse wire just melts and breaks the circuit, because its atoms just can't take any more. A glass of water and a couple of big nails, and we can make another kind of dimmer. It's an old-fashioned idea, they used to use water dimmers in theatres. Attach the nails to the battery circuit and put them in the water. When one nail is taken out of the water, the light goes off. Put it back again and the bulb starts to glow. The water molecules are stopping some of the electrons trying to complete their circuit. So if you don't put enough of them in the water, you get a dimmer light. Look at those bubbles. My assistant in the laboratory is doing an experiment that produces the same sort of reaction. It's a circuit in liquid, and you'll see that there are lots of bubbles being produced. The electrons are breaking up the liquid and releasing gases. These bubbles are oxygen and hydrogen, because those are the gases water is made of. And that's what's in the tank. When electricity does this, it's called electrolysis. And it's caused by the electrons fighting their way past the water atoms to complete the circuit. Shall I show you how to make electricity without a battery, or anything like it? You need a magnet and a loop of wire, that's all. And that's all you do. Pass the wire between the poles of the magnet. The wire is plugged into that meter so you can see and measure how much electricity you're making. It's as simple as that. And remember, there are no batteries in this circuit. Just moving the wire between the poles of the magnet produces electricity.
You can do it the other way around. Hold the wire still and move a magnet through it. The result's the same. Electrons start racing through the wire and you've got electricity. That little white spot moving on the meter shows that it's there. Watch this. When my assistant props up the horseshoe magnet that way round, because it's easier to do this experiment that way, and places it so the poles are on either side of a small coil of wire, she can make the coil spin by plugging it into a battery. Look. That's happening because electricity produces its own magnetic field. And when it's near a magnet, the two magnetic forces meet and make the coil move. That's why electric motors turn. Two magnetic fields meet, one from a magnet, the other from electricity flowing in the wire coil. Simple, isn't it? And it's turned out to be one of the world's most important inventions. The electric motor. Ah, working on your bike again, Piers. Adjusting your dynamo. Good. Yes. Finished. You don't have to turn a wire coil, you can turn the magnet instead. The dynamo on your bicycle produces electricity and powers the lights by doing just that. The magnets inside the casing are spinning at great speed around a coil of wire. And, as I was saying, what would we do without electricity? Well, this place would come to a grinding halt. Look around the house. Electric motors are everywhere. Vacuum cleaner, food mixer, fridge, electric clock, record player. Ah, oh, the list goes on and on. But remember, never ever try and do experiments with the electricity that comes from sockets and plugs. It's very, very dangerous. Stick to batteries, like I do. <laughs>